I'm delighted to talk about uh, the, uh, the zero carbon strategy and to tell you about Landwatch's work. I'm going to leave, we'll leave some time at the end to uh, have questions um, at the end of Ben's presentation. So Landwatch's mission is to inspire civic action that enhances Monterey County's future. Our work focuses on climate change and social inequities in housing, transportation, and land and water use. By educating and mobilizing local citizens, we try to move all of Monterey County jurisdictions to zero carbon, and then as a result, serve as a model for the rest of California. So people often ask, why is Monterey County relevant? Well, our county is really a microcosm of California and the challenges California faces. Here, we experience worsening climate change impacts firsthand. Wildfires, floods, mudslides, sea level rise. We also have a dramatic wealth gap between the coast and the Salinas Valley. This means that many of the people who work on the peninsula commute from the valley where housing is more affordable. As Ben is going to explain, this is a significant climate and social justice challenge. For the past 25 years, Landwatch has organized citizens, and, excuse me, organized residents to address climate, housing affordability, groundwater sustainability, transportation, and related issues. If you're interested in learning more about our accomplishments, they're all cataloged on our website, along with almost every policy or project we've supported over 25 years. So there are five goals that guide what Landwatch does. The first goal is to provide affordable housing for local working families located within mixed income neighborhoods. Second goal is to establish urban growth boundaries that limit sprawl and make cities more sustainable. The third goal, establish strong long-term protections for commercially productive farmlands. Fourth goal is to ensure there is adequate infrastructure such as roads, sewer, and water before developments are approved. And finally, uh, work, we work to improve the regulatory process to try and make it more effective, efficient, and accountable. So this slide summarizes what Landwatch does on a day-to-day -day basis. Our work focuses on the 12 cities and unincorporated areas of Monterey County. So we advocate for sustainability, making sure general plans and specific plans and projects are consistent <clears throat> with the public interest. We scrutinize projects outside of cities that might worsen greenhouse gas emissions, groundwater overdraft, or traffic. We analyze residential and commercial developments, hotels, roads, water supplies, and other infrastructure. We also collaborate with developers on affordable and workforce housing projects in urban areas. We're driven by a passion for this place we live, the people who live here, and a sustainable future. So here's my contact information. If uh, what you hear tonight inspires you to learn more or you want to get more involved, please uh, reach out. Let me know. As, uh, as always, we can certainly use help. Um, and I also encourage you, strongly encourage you, if you can, subscribe to our newsletter. You can go to our website and uh, sign up. It's, it's free and it has a, a lot of information about what we do. Okay, so before I turn the program over to Ben, I want to draw your attention to housing policy is climate policy. Uh, it's an important op-ed that was in the New York Times written by California State Senator Scott Weiner and Berkeley climate scientist Dan Kamen. The article points out that greenhouse gas emissions from transportation are increasing. So in order to solve the climate crisis, we actually also have to solve the housing crisis. The two issues are inextricably linked, and you're going to hear more about that from Ben. The zero carbon plan we're going to discuss tonight came out of a breakfast meeting I had with Mayor Clyde Roberson back uh, last year and later discussions that Ben and uh, Landwatch staff had with the city of uh, Monterey staff. We released a draft report to the city last year, and um, this is really the first time we've had a chance to present it publicly. So we're excited to get your feedback and uh, excited to try and move some of this forward, uh, particularly during the housing element work that we're going to be embarking on. So I'm really happy to, to introduce you to Ben. Uh, he's the president and co-founder of EcoData Lab. 
and he is our uh, Landwatch's climate science and policy consultant. For the past two years, he's worked with Landwatch on a variety of climate issues. In addition to writing the plan you're gonna hear about tonight, he drafted Landwatch's comments on Carmel's climate action plan, the Monterey County climate action plan, CSUMB's master plan, and other projects in the county. As a result of Ben's work for Landwatch, <coughs> CSUMB tripled its reduction of greenhouse gas emission reductions, significantly reduced the building decarbonization from its original plans, and agreed on carbon neutrality by 2045 as its new uh, compliance target. So those were huge wins, and we have Ben um, to thank for it. Ben holds two master's degrees from Berkeley and a bachelor's degree from UC San Diego. In his sparingly spare time, he also serves on the city of Berkeley's Environment and Climate Commission. Uh, ben, take it away. Thanks, Michael. Appreciate the introduction. <clears throat> uh, I'm really excited to be here with everyone tonight. I'm really looking forward to sharing this plan. Um, Michael and I worked very hard on this, and I'm looking forward to hearing your comments at the end of the evening. Uh, I think you can see this PowerPoint now. Is that correct? I'm seeing some nods. Great. Uh, all right, so this plan is looking at the city of Monterey. And here's a quick map for everyone. I assume you're pretty familiar with Monterey, but just to you know, give us some perspective, Monterey's population of about 30,000 residents. It's a little under 10 square miles. There's about 20,000 automobiles registered uh, in the city of Monterey, and two thirds of the residents in Monterey are renters. And this is important information we'll get back to in, in a few minutes. Uh, the city of Monterey put together their own greenhouse gas inventory a few years back. I think this is from 2016. They have a 2005 and a 2012 analysis that they did. And the 2012 analysis shows that 57% of the emissions uh, attributable to the city of Monterey community comes from transportation and 39% comes from buildings. And this is 96% of total emissions from transportation and buildings. So we see these are really the two biggest factors. And in fact, since this is from 2012, uh, building emissions have probably gone down slightly due to Cal Central Coast Community Energy providing 100% renewable power. And so we see transportation would actually be an even larger portion of emissions for the city of Monterey today. Uh, however, these emissions are not limited to residents of the city of Monterey. When a city does a greenhouse gas inventory, it looks at all vehicle trips to and from the city. And in Monterey's case, this includes, this includes a large number of commuters. Remember, we, a couple of slides ago, we saw 20,000 vehicles registered in the city of Monterey. This data from the US Census shows there's another 20,000 vehicles, 22,000 vehicles coming into Monterey every day just for commuting. This is from 2019. It may have changed a little bit, but since a lot of these are probably in-person jobs at things like hotels and hospitals and universities and the aquarium, this probably hasn't changed very much. So we're looking at a large number of commuters driving into Monterey from neighboring communities um, for work, basically. And this adds a significant amount to the city of greenhouse gas emissions from transportation. So looking at this inventory and trying to figure out how to get to zero emissions, we see a few key challenges and opportunities. And the first challenge is that good transit in Monterey isn't really a viable option. With you know, a small population, relatively large area for the population space, pretty low density. We don't have enough people per square mile to really support high quality transit, which is frequent and fast and goes everywhere. It's not really going to be supported at that level. With two thirds of the city being renters, most residents don't control their own home, so they can't choose to electrify themselves, right? We, we can't go to a resident and say, you should install a heat pump because they might say, well, I'm a renter. I don't control my own home. And the third challenge we just saw is that there's a lot of workforce commuters. A lot of people are driving into Monterey and aren't necessarily directly impacted by the city's own policies around electrification or transportation, et cetera. There are some really good opportunities to work with here, however. Um, because Monterey is a very mild climate, it's a small city, it's ideal for walking and biking. It's very easy to get around in, in short time with these lower speed, safer, uh, <clears throat> climate-friendly transportation modes. Uh, the mild climate makes it great for heat pumps. Uh, this is technology that was essentially an air conditioner that runs in reverse to heat your home or provide hot water. And it works well in mild climates because you're not trying to, you know, take heat from a freezing temperature outside and heat up a home with that. It's mild, so it's easy to move heat around. And the other advantage that, as I mentioned before, Central Coast Community Energy provides 100% renewable electricity to all residents and businesses in Monterey. So that makes electrification very environmentally friendly. We don't have any emissions associated with electric energy, electrical energy usage in Monterey. 
And so that means the electrification is really effective at decarbonization here. So talking about transportation, let's look at some of the existing policies at the state and local level. The, the biggest policy that's coming out at the state level is this new advanced clean cars to policy rulemaking from the California Air Resources Board. Uh, you may have heard about this. This is going to require an increasingly high percentage of new car sales in California to be zero emission or electric vehicles. Uh, so the target is starting at, I think, around 25 or 35 percent in 2025 and moving up to 100 percent by 2035 in line with the governor's executive order from a couple of years back. However, because the average vehicle lasts something like 15 years, this will not get us to 100 percent electric vehicles by 2045. Right. So if we have gas cars on the road in 2035 that, that were, you know, gas cars on the road that were sold in 2034, they're going to be on the road for 15 more years. So we will still have gas cars on the road in 2045, which means that Monterey can't rely on state policy alone to reach its zero emission transportation goals. So we have to both look at ways to reduce automobile usage in Monterey and accelerate EV uptake to achieve zero emissions for transportation by 2045. We have to be ahead of the curve on the state and we have to outpace the existing gas car phase outs essentially in order for Monterey to reach zero emissions by 2045. So this is the first challenge or first opportunity, yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> in the other area for natural gas or methane, uh, this is not as good news. The current local and state policy is essentially to just let it all burn. Um, there are no local laws in Monterey County regulating the use of natural gas or methane. There are no laws at the state level yet. However, there are about 59 cities and counties across California that have taken action to either ban natural gas completely, implement reach codes, provide incentives for decarbonizing either new or existing buildings, or otherwise discourage the use of natural gas. The state might take action with the next built-in code cycle, but that wouldn't take effect until 2026 at the earliest. So we're still looking at at least four years, if not in seven years for the next cycle after that, before which the state would really take any action on addressing natural gas or methane use in existing or new buildings. <clears throat> so if we wanna decarbonize all of the buildings in Monterey, we would be looking at around 700 buildings per year for the next 22 years to reach uh, zero emissions from buildings by 2045. So this is a, and that's if we did it every year starting next year. It was a lot of buildings to decarbonize. So we want to get started sooner rather than later. That's what I think. So we have a three-step strategy here overall to achieve zero emissions for Monterey. The first step is to accelerate EV adoption, increase the use of electric vehicles in Monterey and by Monterey residents and commuters and visitors. The second step is to reduce automobile usage overall. For people who either can't afford or aren't going to get to switch to an EV, or for people who, you know, we just don't need to add EVs on the road, reduce automobile, automobile usage entirely, or, you know, so people can get rid of cars, or just drive less and make more room for all the alter alternative transportation modes. And the third step is just electrify all buildings. Again, since it's all zero carbon electricity, uh, this means that it'll be zero emission buildings if you're using electric appliances and heat pumps and so forth. This is an all of the above is necessary approach. We can't leave any of this off the table to reach the target of zero emissions by 2045. We have to do all of these things probably and then some, but these are definitely bare minimums. So looking at the first step, accelerating EV adoption, uh, most of the strategies for accelerating EV adoption involve removing barriers to EV adoption. Uh, and the four key barriers that are present, you know, re globally, nationally, locally, uh, include vehicle cost, lack of vehicle model options. So, you know, until I think this year or next year, you can't really get an electric pickup truck if that's what you want or need for your, for your family. Um, lack of charging availability, and then unfamiliarity with EVs. And so cities can't really do much about how much a vehicle costs or how many vehicle models are being produced, but they can do a lot to impact charging availability and familiarity and knowledge of EVs. So some of the easiest strategies for cities to expand EV charging and make charging more available is to streamline permitting for residential and commercial EV charging. Uh, sorry, someone's unmuted. I don't think you can mute yourself would be great. Um, so right now, Monterey, the city of Monterey is actually not in compliance with the governor's recommended uh, permitting process for EV charging. 
And so that's a, a very low hanging fruit. There's a lot of resources available for meeting that those targets and that um, that that process for EV charging and permitting. Um, another approach is curbside and public charging. This is public charging at things like parking garages, libraries. Um, you know, you can have public charging at, at malls or grocery stores or movie theaters, et cetera, as well as curbside charging. This is a photo of curbside charging in front of San Francisco City Hall, which is on the street in either commercial or residential areas. Um, and this really expands charging opportunities, especially for the renters who might not be able to add EV charging in their own home. And that's why it's so critical that we have this charging widely available for the public. Uh, and then lastly, requiring more EV charging in new development. Monterey hasn't built much housing recently, we'll get into that, but they are required to plan for a substantial amount of new housing and requiring more EV charging and new development and even looking at essentially requiring all parking spaces to be EV ready or EV charging, ready, or EV charging installed for new development would mean that any new residents will be driving electric vehicles to begin with. So that could be another strategy to help uh, increase EV usage and make charging more available more widely. The other component is to expand EV awareness. And this is a lot of on the ground, you know, talking to neighbors and businesses and residents, et cetera, uh, outreach from the city and from community groups like CCL. Uh, this is public outreach like at farmers markets, which you guys were doing already. Uh, festivals, talking to large employers, community institutions, religious libraries, schools, et cetera. Um, and another important piece of this is often EV test drives and ride-alongs. A lot of people aren't familiar with the experience of driving an EV. And once you get them in a car, they often really like it. And so getting people to understand what it's like to experience driving an EV, how it handles, how it responds, you know, there's often a, there's been a more historical perception, it might be changing now, but there's definitely a historical perception of EVs being kind of slow and clunky and kind of like, like golf carts, you know, like not powerful vehicles. That's changing very, that's changing a lot. And so getting people behind the wheel of an EV is really good at helping them understand the opportunities there. And then lastly, dealership education. A lot of automobile dealers themselves are not aware of EV options and charging options and vehicle options, et cetera, around EVs. And so working with dealers is another critical component to making sure that there's widespread community awareness and, and opportunities to find and get good EVs. Uh, for step two, reducing automobile usage, there's two key factors that drive people, pun intended, to choose to drive places. Uh, and these are convenience and safety both the convenience and safety associated with driving and the lack of convenience or lack of safety associated with other alternative modes. And so to get people to drive less and take other options more, you really need to address these factors on both sides of the coin. You need to make uh, taking you know, transit or biking or walking more convenient and more safe. And at the same time, it can help to make driving less convenient as well. And so what are some of these potential strategies for that? Well, around convenience, the number, number, some of the top ones that really impact, impact convenience are reducing speed limits for automobiles, uh, installing bike lanes and pedestrian improvements, building more housing makes it more convenient to walk and bike if you can live close to where you're going, and then also eliminating parking requirements uh, and reducing on-street parking. And this example here is a photo from Vancouver where they took out probably either a lane of cars or on-street parking and put in a protected bike lane there. And then for safety, there's actually a lot of overlap here between convenience and safety. We find that reducing speed limits also makes it a lot safer for cyclists and pedestrians. So does installing bike lanes and these pedestrian improvements, as well as building housing close to jobs and destinations. Removing parking is really just about providing space for those bicycle improvements often and reducing convenience of driving and making it safer and more convenient to bike other places or walk. Uh, so the third step here is to replace natural gas electricity. And there's sort of two major components of this. Number one is well, this, the lower half of the slide. It's actually replacing appliances like gas furnaces, gas water heaters, and gas clothes dryers with all electric alternatives, usually heat pumps or heat pump water heaters, electric heat pump clothes dryers, et cetera. Most people don't have any issue with this because they're not really attached to the fuel choice of their appliances, right? Like you, have, you want hot water to come out, it doesn't matter if it's electric or powered by, by, powered by electricity or natural gas. Often the real challenge is getting people to move from gas cooktops to induction. A lot of people are familiar with old resistive electric cooktops, which are very slow to heat up and clunky and not very efficient or effective at cooking food. Um, induction cooktops are really the way to go. They are very quick and responsive, very energy efficient, easy to clean, and they're very popular with uh, a number of professional chefs. There's a growing popularity. <laughs> they are very safe and effective uh, um, and, and quick and precise. 
We're also finding a growing body of research around the health, around the health hazards of gas stoves indoors. It turns out cooking with a gas stove can raise indoor air pollution levels that several times beyond outdoor hazardous air pollution levels. Um, there's a lot of research around this coming out recently. It's finding that it causes asthma, and especially in children and young adults. Uh, so there's definitely health issues associated with using gas stoves and a lot of reasons to switch to induction cooktops and help popularize that and make it more aware and accessible um, for the public generally. So replacing natural gas with electricity requires a lot of educational outreach, both for contractors develop and developers, but also again for homeowners, landlords, businesses, et cetera, mostly because of the low, well, similar to EV charging, the lack of awareness of options and the unfamiliarity with induction cooktops as an alternative to gas. Um, the city also needs to ban natural gas and new construction. This is the easiest and most cost-effective way to eliminate natural gas and housing is just not to install it in the first place. Uh, Berkeley was the first city in the country to adopt an outright ban on gas and new construction, and it's proven very effective. We have new homes still going up. They're very happy to have induction cooktops, um, all electric, heating, water heating, clothes drying, et cetera. Um, and then the third step is to require electrification during major retrofits and a point of sale. This is still a little tricky. I don't know of any place, any place has implemented regulations on this part yet. Berkeley's looking into it right now. Um, some of the challenges of this equity subsidies often are needed for low-income households to help do the retrofits um, or get the, get the installation in place. Um, and there's also other considerations around equity concerns there too sometimes because the costs are still pretty high for getting heat pumps, et cetera, installed. So to recap, um, we want to see local EV charging and educational outreach to help residents switch to EVs. We want to see bike and pedestrian improvements to help residents avoid driving, and then building electrification policies to help residents eliminate building greenhouse gas emissions. However, these areas only affect really residents. And we remember before the missing piece is these 20, 22,000 in commuters, like more than 100% of current registered vehicles in the city are driving in as well as commuters. So the real challenge here is how can we get 22,000 workers to Monterey without making them drive? Um, and we really need to look at this in ways of reducing automobile usage here. This is part of the second step. So let's look at some of the constraints around getting people to Monterey without making them drive. A large number of these commuters are probably coming from places like Salinas, the, the, the Salinas Valley, further down the coast, et cetera. And this is not a short distance, right? Monterey to Salinas is about 19 miles. Um, just, you know, half hour drive in a car, but if you're trying to walk or bike, that's going to be uh, probably about two hours minimum if you're biking at least the speed that I bike at. Um, <clears throat> and transit is being explored between Monterey and Salinas. They're working on a, on a rail system, I think, between the two, but it's a long way out and it's not going to be available to a lot of people because, again, the transit in, in, within those cities is pretty limited. It's hard to get to or from any given point in Monterey or in Salinas without using a car. Uh, and so a lot of working families can't afford single family homes, which is a big part of the reason that they're living in Salinas in the first place. So the median household income in Monterey County is about 78,000. It's pretty similar in the city of Monterey, but the median price of a home in Monterey is 1.2 million. And I don't know if you've done the math, but uh, I can't afford a $1.2 million home on a $78,000 salary. I don't know about anybody else here. It's not something that working families can really afford. And the rent in Monterey isn't much better. So I just checked uh, this actually yesterday. The, afford the average rent for a two bedroom Monterey right now is $2,600 a month, which is just barely the maximum a, a family at making the median income can afford. Uh, it's not much better for a one bedroom. It's, only it's still 2,100. So the rents for most apartments in Monterey are basically the upper limit of what a median household could afford at their upper limit as well without saving any money, without you know, putting away money for college, for family or retirement, et cetera. So it's pretty financially constrained if you wanna live in Monterey, making a median income, which is why a lot of people are living further out. And the fact of the matter is that these home prices and rents have been going up in Monterey for a long time. And mostly it's because Monterey has not built much if any housing. And since 2017, they've built about 22 homes. I think all of which were either single family or ADUs. So they're relatively larger homes, more expensive. And we just see these home prices continue going up because we're adding more jobs, population growth, people want to live in temperate climates and they're not adding more homes. So it's sort of a supply and demand crunch. You know, people want to live here, not enough homes available. So the rent and prices go up. So to recap, we're trying to figure out how to get 20,000 workers to Monterey without making them drive. 
We know they're commuting in from other places like Salinas, which is cheaper. Monterey is very expensive. Most of these emissions coming trans from coming from transportation. And so this really gets to what Michael was talking about earlier in terms of why housing policy is climate policy. This shortage of housing in Monterey has driven up prices, driven workers further out, and as a result, driven up greenhouse gas emissions as well. So the solution to this is pretty simple, at least on paper. It's build more housing close to jobs and destinations. So here's an example that I pulled off of Google Maps, Google Street View. This is a 76 gas station on Lighthouse Avenue in Monterey. It is across the street from a bus stop, a CVS, two blocks from Andronico's grocery store, a couple of blocks from the Monterey Bay Aquarium with a number, number of jobs there, and it's a major thoroughfare. This gas station, of course, will not be in business for forever. It won't be in business forever, hopefully not for much longer for successful at increasing EV uptake because we won't be buying any more gasoline in Monterey or in California in the next 30 years. So the opportunity here is really to turn sites like this that are really underutilized and underdeveloped into you know, low to mid-rise missing middle homes, as well as adding in bike lanes so people can get around without having to drive in these neighborhoods. Um, so this is a, just a mock-up rendering, not necessarily well, scale uh, or accurate. You know, just well, a quick rough draft of what it could look like. I think someone's unmuted again. If you can mute yourself. I know we got plastic problems. Clearly, that'd be great. Um, so I mentioned missing middle housing. Oh. Uh, a lot of housing is being developed in cities these days is often mid-rise housing, sort of four to six stories. You hear about five over one podium construction, maybe, which is five frames of five stories <laughs> wood frame housing over one story concrete podium. There's also a lot of opportunity in missing middle housing, which are these sort of duplexes, fourplexes, bungalow court, et cetera, which are sort of a higher density, but still low rise multifamily housing type that is actually pretty abundant in Monterey in a number of older areas of the city but is not currently legal to build anywhere at all, I think, not at this, not at this kind of scale. So this is another opportunity to have sort of more general density in areas outside of the commercial areas that can add housing capacity without significantly changing the physical characteristics of a neighborhood. Uh, so here's a couple of photos and comments on strategies to, to build more housing for workers to reduce vehicle usage. Uh, so our recommendations are to, enable, to encourage and allow Four to six stories of mixed use or residential development around commercial areas alongside bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. This housing, in line with previous comments, would be all electric, minimal parking, and EV charging for all those spaces. So it would be zero emission housing and zero emission lifestyles there. Uh, and on the photo on the top, you can see a photo of a, I think it's a four on this story building on the left and a six story building on the right, which is in downtown Monterey. So this is, you know, already present in Monterey, just not in very many quantities. Uh, the next piece to allow missing middle and multifamily low-rise housing in residential areas. And the second photo is a photo of actually a bungalow court a couple blocks away from the first photo, just outside of downtown in, in Monterey. Um, this is, I think, four or six homes along a shared courtyard in the center. And they're smaller homes, you know, like I think five or 800 square feet. Um, but that makes it much more affordable for working families, young families, smaller households, et cetera. And then the other key piece is to support affordable housing with both funding and incentives. So affordable housing is the technical term we're using here. It means subsidized housing for low-income households. So a low-income household in Monterey in the county is a household making less than $62,000 a year, I think, for a family of two or four or something like that. And so these are really people who are working lower paying jobs or have less education or experience or just younger often generally as well. Um, and having subsidized housing for them means they can live close to where they work. They can work these jobs that are often not paying enough to buy a home in Monterey, but are still critical to Monterey's economy. Um, it helps make sure they can stay in the community and get around without having to drive everywhere. So the city of Monterey has been assigned by AMBAG, but by really by the state regional housing needs allocation process, a target of planning to build 3,600 homes by 2031. And if the city is able to actually meet this goal in these more walkable, transit-friendly and bikeable areas of the city, this could mean as many as 7,000 workers who are no longer commuting from outside the city which in turn would result in about a 10 to 20% reduction in transportation emissions alone just from building these, this required housing essentially. So we're already seeing just by running you know, rough numbers and estimates that meeting the city's housing requirements and housing workers who are currently living outside the city can have substantial impacts on Monterey's transportation, transportation emissions and its ability to reach zero emissions by 2045. So to recap, all the policies we talked about originally around EV charging, educational outreach, 
bicycle pedestrian improvements and building electrification policies would help residents make sure they're living zero emission lifestyles with using EVs or not driving at all and having no emissions from their household energy use. Building more housing, cultural jobs and destinations in Monterey would help the commuters to Monterey currently become residents and benefit from all those above policies. Monterey can't control what happens in other cities. They can't control Carmel Valley or Salinas or anywhere else in the county, but they can help make it so that more people who want to live in Monterey are able to do so and benefit from Monterey's leadership on being a zero carbon city. And so just to touch it off at the end, here's an example of what this could look like. This is today's downtown Monterey. And this is a, this is a mock-up of what it could look like with four to six stories of zero emission homes for working families above the current uh, retail stores two-way cycle tracks to allow biking through downtown with new parklets to add more pedestrian and, act and then pedestrian activity, and then curbside EV charging as well to help and make sure anybody who is still commuting or doesn't have a, a EV charging at home can then charge an EV as well. Uh, and that is my presentation. I think, my, I think I'm a little, was a little quick, but we still have plenty of time left over for questions. I know I saw a bunch in the chat and I see some hands raised. I think it will hand it back to Mike Clancy to lead the discussion after this. Hey, thanks, Ben. Fantastic discussion. Really interesting. Um, I love the bit, the business about housing policy is climate policy. That's a great quote, and I think it's really, really true. Um, you didn't mention carpooling. What about carpooling with regard to, you know, people coming in from the outside? For example, I know up in the Bay Area around Mill Valley, I've seen places where people apparently um, come and park their cars and then they get in either carpool or they get into some kind of mass transit, like a bus or something like that, and then go elsewhere to their job and they come back, you know. What about something like that, you know, say, you know, somewhere along Highway 1 in Marina or Castroville or something like that? Did you look at anything like that? Yeah, some of the challenges that I've seen with carpooling is that it's very dependent on having a shared either origin or destination or usually both, right? So, for example, you can carpool with your coworkers if you're all on the same schedule, going at the same place, coming from the same area or along the same route, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very, very limited utility for an area that's like Monterey County that's already very spread out and very low density overall. Um, it's a similar to the same problem we said with transit, right? Like if you want to take a, you know, a park and ride to a bus, well, the buses take you where you need to go. And there aren't a lot of places along you know, the place of the bus because it can't go right now because everything's so spread out and, and, and sort of, right? and then not very compact, essentially. Um, yeah. So that can have an impact. Uh, it's also challenging to maintain, maintain that systematically because people switch jobs, they move or they, et cetera. That means the system for, for carpooling falls apart. And so you really want a systematic, we wanted a systematic approach that would make sure that anybody living in the, in the city could get around without having to worry about driving or carpooling or making sure the bus went to their home or went to their stop or whatever it is. We're trying to think mm -hmm. about ways we could do it systematically. Michael? Okay. Hey, so, so Mike, and, um, just a heads up, we're going to be doing another session like this in about, I don't know, two weeks with MST. They have a, a surf project, which is a rapid transit uh, bus system from Marina into downtown Monterey. Yeah. And so there are some public uh, mass transit systems that are developing. You know, the challenge is really the numbers um, and getting the densities up and making it, you know, easy for people to use those systems. Right now, if you're in the bus coming from Marina, you're going to hit all the same traffic a car will. And so, you know, the hope is that that with these, uh, you know, the, the MST surf system, that there'll be mm -hmm. a more rapid movement. And, and their early, um, you know, analysis shows a pretty significant decline in greenhouse gas emissions. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I also like the discussion about the EV charging. Um, you know, the EV charging stations for renters, I think there's a lot of potential there. You know, maybe the city can pass some type of policy that would encourage landlords to provide EV charging, um, you know, part, part of their, part of their um, you know, their, their properties there. And uh, I, I also kind of like the idea of encouraging businesses to provide EV charging for their employees, for employee parking. Kind of imagine a, a future where, you, know, you drive your EV to work in Monterey and you park it in the employee parking lot and there's an EV charger right there for you. It could even be a level one charger, let it charge you all day long. And um, then you, you, know, you drive home and basically, you know, you're, you're, you're driving to and from work for free and charging with green energy. And, you know, that's a win-win around there. So anyway, I want to open it up uh, to other questions. Uh, please uh, un unmute and, and chime right in. 
I, I have a question. This is Beth. Hi, Beth. Hi. I have a few comments. I thought, Mike, your comments were very good. And I think the city of Monterey is actually a great candidate for va electric van pooling. Um, I have a lot of experience with that because people are going to a fairly centralized destination in downtown Monterey. But actually, my, my other comments were on the barriers. Um, I just happened to have had a conversation this week with some guys who work for the Fuels and Transportation Division for the California Energy Commission. They told me they have a billion dollars, and I don't know if it's just for their division, uh, to encourage electrification and EV charger infrastructure. And one of their top priorities is um, EV chargers for multifamily housing, because they also have um, equity goals um, in implementing their um, funding allocations. So I think that's a great place to look for multifamily uh, EV charging infrastructure funds because the funds will be there. And as we all know, the state of California is pretty fat right now. Uh, don't know how long that will last. Um, the other thing I want to mention is I think it is a great place for public transit. Actually, I'm a new resident there, so I'm, maybe I'm speaking out of turn. I know they just started the biofuel trolley uh, that takes the tourists all around and around in circles. Um, and so I think that's another area where we could reduce uh, GHG from uh, vehicles. And then I also want to mention I moved to Monterey from Pasadena. And Pasadena is famous for being the city in Southern California that has the highest percentage of EV users. And I'm one of them. And one of the best things that they have, which was funded in part by state funds, is something called Power Up Pasadena. It is a huge um, parking lot filled with fast chargers that are absolutely free. And um, so it's, it's, there's always an available charger. They're all in a central location. And it has encouraged uh, quite a few people to actually go out there and finally purchase an EV. Um, so I, I encourage you guys to look into that experiment by the city of Pasadena. Um, it's a great um, learning example. Uh, finally, I think, isn't it, uh, isn't it car week? Anybody know that? I mean, it seems like uh, what we do uh, where I work uh, down here in Southern California is we do an electric car show. So if there's a car week where people are showing their really cool classic cars, um, we I would encourage you guys to look at uh, doing an electric car show with the city. Um, it seems like uh, it would be fun and I will bring my electric cars. So uh, I'll volunteer. And uh, one more thing, sorry, two more things. I'm sorry I'm talking too long. Um, no, one no. is on safety in Southern California. We have an association of governments um, and Monterey, there is one too. And they have a program that's called Go Human. Um, and you can get lots of money to do things to change the streets into pedestrian and cyclist friendly um, um, transport lanes um, with colorful markers and all kinds of stuff. So that's something to look into, source of money for that. And then finally, I'm just gonna do a plug. We actually scheduled a local climate action um, subcommittee of the CCL chapter for after this meeting. So that will be at 8.30 to nine. And um, we're all going to try to um, enforce our local city's climate action plans. And I'm from the city of Monterey and I read their old plan. So I'm excited to read the new plan. And I think I just have a question of whether the new plan that you've written is actually something that's enforceable or is it just a guideline? Because to me that in my experience, that's the fundamental problem with these is they're not requirements on the city. And I'm done talking, I'll shut up, I'll go on. Thanks, Beth. Fantastic. Great comments there. Um, I'll answer that last question really briefly. This is a recommendation for the city. Um, we are doing this as a, in language is a nonprofit, that's not the city agency. And so we're providing this recommendation for the city and for the community to, to, to encourage and support, um, but the city has not adopted it and it's not enforceable or even budgeted for in the city at this point. So one, one of the things we're really hoping is that the work that Ben has done on climate um, is able to be used throughout the housing element up, update process. So as you mentioned, the city has to, over the next couple of years, figure out how to um, uh, include another 3,000 um, uh, units of housing. And we're strongly um, going to advocate for, you know, multifamily housing, uh, small units, a whole variety of approaches that try to build, try to make it feasible to get more workers in the city to address the specific problem of commuting and greenhouse gases. So this for us is sort of a, a, a guide to how we are going to advocate in front of the city and uh, work with them. And I see we have 
the mayor, uh, Clyde uh, Roberson, who actually helped catalyze this whole um, discussion. So thank you, Clyde. Yeah, good on you guys. This is really a great start and it's, it's, it's invaluable to have a plan like this. It lays out a baseline and gets the discussion going. Jody, you have, a, you have your hand raised? Yes. Go ahead. Hi, everybody. I'm, my name is Jody Emerson and I live in a condominium in Monterey and I have an EV. Um, I'm grateful to the city of Monterey for the electric charging that we do have. It's a little spotty, but we have some. Um, there's nothing here at my condo. And the board so far is pretty negative about any kind of solar panels or electric charging. Of course, there's a whole controversy about rooftop solar versus supporting 3CE, Community Voice Energy. And that's a whole nother topic. I have a, I'm trying to convert my, my gas appliances to electric and I'm having a difficult time finding electricians, plumbers who know anything about electric heat pump water heaters or heaters, et cetera. If you have any suggestions about who to go to for help, I would appreciate it. I don't have Is any it, suggestions. Does that have a comment here? Oh. So what am I? Ed M, did you have a reply to Jody there? Oh, okay. DB Heating and Cooling in Pacific Grove is putting in my heat pump. He seems pretty knowledgeable. And he's uh, approved by PCCE um, and has access to some rebates, actually, if you're eliminating gas heat. So, What was the name? Dave Brown Heating and Cooling, DB Heating and Cooling in Pacific Grove. Dave? Dave Brown. Brown. D. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Very good. Uh, Pete Schatz, have your hand up. Yeah, hi, um, Ben. I I think that's a really interesting plan. Um, my question is, you know, converting all those houses to electric and putting in all that extra EV charging capacity. How much are you going to have to do to the existing electrical grid to be able to supply all that power? Um, you know, because you know, I, I, I run a solar system at home, you know, so I know how much power, you know, when you, when you try to heat something with electrical power, you try to charge an EV, you know, you're pulling a lot of power. Does the existing grid have the capacity to do that? And sort of how do you, how do you address that? Yeah, great question, Pete. Uh, so short answer, no, the existing grid does not have capacity to do that with renew, especially not with renewables. Um, if we converted every automobile in California to EVs overnight, we would increase electrical capacity, electrical use in California by 50%, essentially. Mm -hmm. And that's not counting for the use of heat pumps, induction cooktops, in water heaters, uh, et cetera. So I would just ballpark. You would want to double electric generation in California over the, over the same time period as you're doing the transition away from fossil fuel, transportation, and heating, et cetera. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't do it, right? We just need to build a lot of solar panels and wind farms, et cetera. Um, because of 3CE, it's not as critical for individual residents to install solar panels on their own roofs to achieve zero emission energy, but we do need a statewide strategy to ensure we have enough renewable energy available. So that is going to mean things like offshore wind and large solar farms and more rooftop solar where base, where they were feasible. Um, but it's not so much an individual city or residential concern as it is more of a, the state needs to figure out a strategy for that in the long run, I think. Okay, yeah, so so as a follow on to that, I mean, one thing that I've gotten really interested in is, is thinking of EVs as um, fairly inexpensive batteries on wheels. I know with my own system, 10, 10 kilowatts of power um, cost a lot of money for a fixed battery connected to my solar system, but you know, uh, an EV has seven to 10 or more times the capacity and costs less, certainly on a per kilowatt hour basis. Um, are you aware of efforts in California to work on the vehicle to grid, you know, with the EVs that are starting to come out with the bi-directional batteries? And, you know, when do you think that's going to arrive? Yeah, it's another great question. That's a, that's a national issue as well. It's not just specific to California, right? 
And a lot of the issue, I think, is partly around, you know, charger and plug standards because they all, almost all, they all use different chargers, different plugs, et cetera. It's a whole crazy nightmare. Um, the battery technology uh, and the control technology is getting to the point where they're starting to enable or at least potentially enable vehicle to grid integration for the vehicles. Um, it's a question of the grid operators as well. The California Independent System Operator, I'm not aware of, I don't know if they have any current infrastructure or plans to enable uh, vehicle to grid. However, vehicle to microgrid or vehicle to, you know, uh, or like individual nano, you know, sort of household grid, um, that's much more, I think, likely in the short term um, and feasible. Uh, I think the challenge is going to be that when people have their EVs plugged in, they're not usually there to provide grid resources. And sort of to um, Mike Lentz's earlier comment, we are actually, I think we're actually need a lot of workplace charging because given the renewable you know, generation port, uh, portfolio in California, we have a lot of solar producing energy during the day. So we want people charging their cars during the day, actually, rather than at night when people usually do it right now at homes. Um, and so if we're having people charging their cars during the day, need that you know, while they're at work, for instance. And then if the car is charged at work, they don't really need to charge her at home for a lot of these renters or condo owners or even single family homeowners if you're charging it you know, one day a week at work, for instance. So I am not sure there's gonna be a very large scale application for vehicle to grid energy. I think it's gonna be more for micro microgrid or like local energy use or like the Ford F-150 Lightning they're going to have like regular 120 volt outlets. So you can plug in small appliances and you know serve as a local generator kind of thing, or for tools on a job site. Um, that's what yes. I'm currently seeing. Yeah. Yeah. So far, the the auto industry has been slow to adapt that, which I think is unfortunate. Uh, to my knowledge, the Ford F-150 Lightning and the Hyundai Ioniq 5 are the only two that right now that do vehicle to load. I'm pretty sure. But um, to the original speaker's question, I think it makes a, a lot of sense. You know, there's an awful lot of battery capacity out there in vehicles. And, you know, um, it'd be great if the auto industry would really jump on board with that. Marla, your hand's up. Marla, you want to unmute and ask a question? Okay. <laughs> took a little time to unmute. Yeah. Um, I just wondered, I think some of those cars coming into town uh, come, are not workers necessarily. There's quite a number of tourists and tourism is certainly one of the big sources of income for the city of Monterey. Uh, there's also second homeowners, uh, which contribute to the shortage of housing too. And uh, uh, many people, uh, instead of separate freestanding homes would own the condos and apartments. There's also quite a, uh, Monterey is a service center for all kinds of um, uh, medical health services, attorneys, uh, you know, there's all kinds of professional services and shopping that people drive in from where I am, way out in Carmel Valley, uh, to <clears throat> go to the big city. So I just was wondering how you had, uh, <clears throat> if you had considered those as part of the plan. Yeah, great comments there, Marley. Thank you. So, you know, we can't cover everything in Monterey because Monterey isn't the, the president of California, you know, like we can't we can't control everywhere, everyone, all at once. Um, I think that for the, some, of the some of the tourism things, that can shift to EVs, especially as rental vehicles become more EV sooner. Rental cars are used very heavily as they have a lot more fleet turnover there. And because EVs last so long, once I think the EV market is really, really up, like sort of geared up, and once EV charging is available, we'll see rental cars become EV much faster than the, probably the California fleet overall is my guess. Um, and then I think providing EV charging, helping drive the cultural shifts forward in Monterey County will be helpful, but there's no real way we can get, you know, if you know, you're driving from Carmel Valley, you know, up to Monterey to go shopping or to the hospital or whatever it is, we can't really influence all of that as directly as we might like to. Um, so for this policy, we're looking at what's the big critical necessary parts for Monterey to do to really make sure it can meet those targets. This is not to say the plan will get us to those targets, but it's sort of looking at what's the big step we have to do for sure that we can't succeed without, essentially. So one of the things we asked Ben to do, uh, Marley, early on was to look at uh, tourism. And we have, I think, on our website, an analysis that Ben did, which basically says that Tourism as, compo as compared with commuting is not a significant um, a source of greenhouse gas emissions. It's really the commuting and the number of cars that come in every single day 
uh, for workers. And, you know, we've got, uh, I think, a reasonable analysis that shows that, um, you know, of the things to worry about, the, the most important thing to worry about is getting at least uh, uh, is getting housing closer to the the, the jobs um, for the housing component piece that Ben talked about. Uh, I also was wondering just about the historic buildings. Uh, I've always been really glad that Monterey saved so many of its historic adobes. And um, in Europe, uh, increased traffic has uh, often weakened some of the historic buildings. Do we know if, um, if, there, if traffic and usage continue to grow with uh, electric, ve ve even with electric vehicles with more housing, how is that going to impact some of the historic buildings in the city? I don't think we did analysis on that, um, but I can say that part of the policies we're recommending would really mean that any new residents are actually driving less than is currently being driven, right? So we're, we're recommending things like reducing or eliminating or parking minimums for new developments and making sure they're all electric and installing bike lanes to reduce on-street parking. So these are all strategies that help people rather than driving to Monterey every day from Salinas, let's say, and driving past those historic buildings, they could live a few blocks down the road or you know, in, in New Monterey and bike over, for instance. So this policy is really designed to reduce driving overall rather than increase traffic by adding more residents. It's designed to reduce driving overall, both by new and future residents. But we didn't look at how that would impact historic buildings specifically. Great, thanks. John Kern raised a question in the chat. So I'm gonna steal his thunder and raise it on the video here. And that is uh, water. You know, water is the other perennial problem with regard to development uh, on, the Mon on the Monterey Peninsula. So, um, you know, is there enough water available to support um, moving people onto the peninsula? And if not, what do we do about it? Is that part of your plan? Um, so let me let me take that one, Ben. You can weigh in. So in the short term, uh, with the cease and desist order uh, on the the uh, Cal -AM and the the Regional Water Management District, no, there isn't enough water. However, with the likely expansion of the Pure Water uh, uh, Project Phase Two um, and the addition of another, I think it's 2,250 acre feet, that should be enough water for um, it's estimated for 20, 20 to 30 years. I think that's what Dave Stoll in the Water Management District estimate. So there's certainly some challenges for water, particularly in the near term. I think that there's a, a, a decent long-term plan that uh, will let us, um, you know, achieve the the housing numbers that we have in this particular cycle, the sixth cycle of Rena. Um, but you know, it it, uh, it it definitely depends on things like the CPUC and others approving these, um, you know, the the the, the uh, water contracts and some of the other agreements. So there's some uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Okay, other questions or comments? I have a comment. <clears throat> yes, Jeff. I think towns like, like Carmel and Pacific Grove and Monterey could do a great deal to encourage electric vehicles by providing many, many more charging positions in town, in public lots, in parking spaces. Uh, so if they have the money, and if they can manage it, they should, they should invest in charging stations. Great point. I'll just add a brief comment to that. Um, there's opportunities for the city to have either revenue neutral or revenue positive EV charging stations available by essentially leasing public right of way to EV charging uh, service providers, right? So rather than having the city pay for, buy, maintain, install the EV chargers. They can you know, lease or offer permits to EV charger providers to put in and manage assist the charging themselves, which makes it a lot easier on the city because they don't have the technological know-how or financial resources to manage it. They can let essentially let the market do that, but help them encourage and facilitate it by making that permitting streamlined and easy and available. Yes, Laura and then Ann. Go ahead, Laura, and then Ed. Go ahead, Laura. 
Got it. Thank you. Um, you know, I've looked into EVs, but I just don't see that there's much of an inventory for used electric vehicles. And I'm, I'm a renter and a single person and all that good stuff. So I can't really afford a brand new electric vehicle. So I'm just um, curious if there's any thoughts or comments from anyone really about um, more used inventory of electric vehicles coming onto the market. Yeah, so that's large a factor of people didn't buy new EVs five years ago very much, right? So there hasn't been a lot of supply of EVs to begin with. And so the used market is going to tail the, the new market by several years. Um, I think some of the good news that I would share on this front is that a lot of people that I know have been leasing EVs rather than buying them because the technology is changing so fast still that there's, there's going to be a lot of used leased EVs available, um, probably either on the used market or they're going to go to rental car companies in my guess. Um, I think also with the advanced clean cars two ruling, increasing the sale of EVs soon, like as soon as 24, 25, driving that up quickly, that'll lead to more used EVs coming on the market eventually. Um, the other good news is that there are some cities available, there are some cities I think currently available even to buy for low-income houses to buy used EVs in California. So I saw some research done by Energy Innovation LLC that I think said that used EVs are actually the most cost-effective vehicle for low-income Californians today, which is the good news there. But the truth is inventory is still limited and that's just gonna take a, take some time for the new cars to roll into used market. It, it might be worth pointing out the federal and California state um, tax rebates for new EVs um, as car makers uh, push out lower cost lines. It's 7,500 federal and up to 3,000, I think California, there's two programs for it, depending on whether you qualify. So when you look at the, the sticker price on a new EV, keep that in mind. Thank you. And also you need to factor in your reduced maintenance costs of the lifetime of the car. There are too. no maintenance costs on an EV. You just have to rotate your tires. <laughs> well, you got to put air in them. Yeah. <laughs> and Annie? Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, thank you for the presentation. Good to talk with you all. I'm um, uh, on Landwatch's board. And I think as I've always thought about uh, reducing emissions in the transportation sector and the personal one, there's three-legged stool. It's cleaner, more efficient vehicles, uh, cleaner combustion and drive less. And I think the fact that um, we have an opportunity here in Monterey County with the new housing elements to, to, to work on land use so that we build more, so that people ha get to don't have to get in a car, whether it's electric or an efficient vehicle. That's really going to be a game changer. So I think that you know I understand that land use is you know a difficult issue for a lot of local governments, but this is really a moment in time where uh, the climate crisis is calling out for new ideas and uh, bold action. So I appreciate the emphasis on. Uh, land use and housing here. And I, you know, I hope that uh, the mayor and others who have jurisdiction over land use uh, appreciate how important that is. Um, kind of interest, I, you know, I'd be interested in what people think about the likelihood of making some significant changes in that area is. <laughs> Thank you, Annie. I'd, I'd, I'd like to um, add my um, thanks to Mayor Roberson to the comments Michael made earlier. Thanks, uh, Mayor Roberson, for the leadership on getting this going. I think it's really valuable. Would you like to make a few comments? Can I unmute there? Can you unmute? No, I don't mean to put him on the spot, <laughs> but I just think that, you know, that is uh, identifying something that we all know is has been challenging in the past, but with the fact that climate and um, transportation is such a significant contribution to the situation we're in, I, I know I feel like this is a moment in time for new ideas. Well, we're kind of coming near the end here, and I'd like to um, offer Mayor Roberson the final words on this, uh, given the fact that he kind of started this whole thing. Go ahead. We can hear you. Go ahead, Clyde. Uh, oh, you don't, have, you don't have a microphone or something like that. Okay. All right. Well, that's okay. That's all right. 
<laughs> okay, anyone else? Okay, well, thanks again, Mike, for inviting me us. And, and thanking uh, uh, Michael and Ben. I thought that was an excellent presentation. I think the city's in, in good hands here. Thank and, you. Uh, well done yep. to you, you gentlemen for working on this and uh, keep up the good work, keep moving it forward. And we'll be uh, looking forward to seeing uh, what's going on. And, and we'll be looking forward to engagement with the city on this as we go, as we move forward. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, all. everyone. And those of you who are interested in sticking around, um, uh, we're going to shortly um, begin our um, secondary meeting, which is the uh, CCL Local Climate Activism Committee, committee meeting. Folks who are interested in um, getting a little more actively involved in, um, in uh, some of our activities. So let's take a five minute break and then rejoin. Uh, let's rejoin in about five minutes. Sounds right, good. You can stay on the line, stay on the line, stay in the meeting, but uh, we'll come back and uh, start discussion in about five minutes. <laughs> 